Thank you so much for your hospitality in having us here today. It's great to have some students from Newbold here and it's great for my wife and I to be back at the UK after 10 years and uh, it's a privilege to be speaking to you this morning. Which voice should I listen to? My wife, my big sister, or the female voice on my satellite navigation? What a dilemma. You see, we were travelling from Bruges to the tulip fields of Kuchenhof in a convoy of cars. In our car, there was my wife with her map of Europe sitting there and my younger daughter. In the other car was my big sister and her husband and my eldest daughter and we're connected by walkie-talkies and they have a Garmin sat-nav that they're just trying out. As we passed through a toll tunnel in Belgium under one of those pieces of water, the satellite receiver and the receiver disconnected. So coming out of that tunnel, my satellite didn't tell me exactly what I wanted to know when I needed to know it. Because there was an exit. And I wasn't quite sure what to do. Should I remain on the motorway? Or should I take the exit? So to be sure, I thought, easy. I'll take the exit. If it's wrong, we'll get back on, no problem. If I stay on, I've got the problem of when will I get off again and how do I do it? Just as I started to go off, the satellite and the receiver connected, telling me to stay on. Now, if it was just our car, I would have manoeuvred and stayed on the motorway. But because I was in a convoy, although I trust my brother-in-law implicitly, I figured I'd better stay with the plan of action and go off. Well, the satellite navigation found its way around all these amazing back streets that I would never have known existed and brought us back to the point of the motorway. And that was my dilemma. My wife, with her book of European maps, was sitting there saying, I go one way. My big sister, on the two-way radio, back in the car following her sat-nav, was telling me to go another way. And the lady on my nav man was telling me to go another way. And here am I trying to concentrate on driving. Which voice do I listen to? Well, rightly or wrongly, I chose to listen to my sat nav. You can understand what, created, what drama that created. As it turned out, the sat nav, my nav man, took me back through that toll tunnel to come back through the toll tunnel again and resume from where we missed off. My brother-in-law was not impressed and he named my sat-nav Delilah. <laughs> the name stuck with that sat-nav for a very long time. As we come to our passage of scripture this morning, the question I think Paul is asking us is, which voice do you listen to? You see, Paul is writing to Timothy, the young pastor at the church of Ephesus. You need to remember that Ephesus is a place that Paul knows very well. His ministry was usually fairly itinerant. A few months here, a few months there. But in Ephesus, he was there for at least three years. It was a place he knew well. It was a church he knew well. And he says in this final chapter of the first epistle, the passage we're looking at is 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. He says, don't listen to the voices of the old women retelling myths or in the Pacific terms where I have spent some time telling stories. Don't just discipline your body at the gym.
because it doesn't last. Choose godly discipline, the discipline that will last in this world and the world to come. Now, before we get too far into the passage, I think it's really important we understand a little bit about Ephesus. You see, Ephesus was world-renowned and world-famous for the goddess Diana, otherwise known as Artemis. Diana was a significant goddess in Greek mythology. She was the daughter of Zeus and Leto. And the cult of Diana was extremely important to not only the economy but the social fabric of the city of Ephesus. And Acts chapter 19 tells us just how important that really was. Because Demetrius was very concerned that he heard Paul, who was in Ephesus, talking to so many people about not worshipping gods made of wood and stone and silver, but to worship the true God. And Demetrius started to understand that that would have a big impact on not only his business as a silversmith, but at many of his other colleagues who thrived in the city because when people came to visit the great statue and temple of Diana, they would buy those little images and take them away. Paul was obviously a threat, an economic threat. And around the cult of Diana, there were many myths and legends. No wonder Paul refers to the old wives' tales. But it's very interesting that Paul contrasts in verse 6 the words of faith and nourishment, of sound doctrine, with the words and the worldly myths of Diana and the Ephesians in verse 7. To which voice are you listening? The nourishment from the words of faith and sound doctrine or the worldly myths of today? The other point I'd like to make about Ephesus is this. Like many other Greek and Roman cities, it had many gymnasiums and it also had a very large stadium. This was a common pastime to be very active. They started at school and students learnt lessons in art, sports, literature, drama and speech. The amphitheatre in Ephesus that you can still see the ruins of today would seat about 25,000 people. And in front of that amphitheatre was the great big stadium. And behind that was the harbour. So if you arrived in Ephesus in the harbour, you'd see the stadium, you'd see the amphitheatre. No wonder Paul contrasts the discipline of the gym the building of the body, the pursuit of athletic status and the involvement in the stadium. He contrasts that with godly discipline. The bodily discipline from the gym, it says, doesn't last. But the godly discipline, in verse 10, it says, will be there for eternity. Because it's inspired by Jesus' love for all humanity. And it's informed by the words of faith and sound doctrine. Which discipline are you following? I want to just reflect for a moment or two on godly discipline. Because verse 10 tells us very clearly, godly discipline comes from fixing our hope on the living God who is the saviour of all humanity and especially the believers. Faith and sound doctrine gives us the knowledge and hope of that living God. 
It gives us the comforter that the item so beautifully shared. Faith and sound doctrine teaches us about the Saviour and his love for all humanity. Faith and sound doctrine invites us to respond to the salvation that Jesus has so freely offered. It invites us to choose to become a disciple of Jesus. And by becoming a disciple of Jesus, we enter into godly discipline. We learn to live like Jesus. We learn to follow in his footsteps. We learn to surrender our lives and desires to his will. And as scripture says here, it benefits life here and now as well as for the world to come. It seems to be Paul's way of saying, be in the world of the Ephesians, but not of the world of the Ephesians. Don't follow the confused crowd of voices of the amphitheatre in Ephesus who didn't know why they were chanting Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Fix your hope, fix my hope, fix our hope on the living God who is the saviour of all humanity, especially the believers. Follow Jesus, whatever he asks, wherever he sends. And as we come into this communion service, just as Jesus invited his disciples many years ago, I invite you as his disciples today to celebrate your commitment to living the discipline of faith and sound doctrine by sharing this meal together. Listen to God's voice. Be his disciple.